Greetings class, Chris Haskins here with the realestateroundup.com and once again, thank you for joining me with another flip tip. Today, <coughs> excuse my post nasal drip, you're gonna get my cough, that's how it's gonna be. I've got, I've been diagnosed with post nasal drip and that's just an allergic thing that I gotta deal with and I hope you can look past it, so here we go. Today's class is gonna be about, I want to explain to you why I left the music business for the real estate investing business. Why I left the music business for the real estate investing business. There's about 13 things I'm gonna cover with you today. I'm gonna to do it as fast as I can, but I want to make sure I get into your minds and your heads and help you with your entrepreneurial vision to where you wanna take your life because I've been in the music business as you'll see as we get through with this training. And to further my mission statement, which is to uplift the financial literacy of my fellow man through real estate investing, through, through real estate investing, uplift the financial literacy of my fellow man through real estate investing. All right, let's get right into this thing. And I want to make sure I always ask you subscribe to my channel, even though this thing weighs a ton. Take 30 seconds, go down, hit click the button because I'm going to be getting deep into you today, guys. I'm going to be kind of digging into you today. And that's okay. So, I'm going to tell you, I was in the music business back in 2000, what is it, this is my, one of my biggest ones with, with 8 Mile, we did the, with, what's up my boy Jay Praise with the Wainster Joint, and I'm just pulling these plaques out, I've had these things put up because it's Destructive Lifestyle, 702, what's up Pitt Conley, I was work, work, working for him for a while, got an opportunity, I can't find my Dave Hollister one, but what's up Dave, met Dave out there at, at Winmark many many years ago in Virginia Beach but the real estate the I'm sorry the music business it is designed to keep you broke I want you to just picture a nerdy guy with the big thick glasses sitting at a computer all day they have at music companies and publishing companies have something called statisticians statisticians what they do is they sit there and what they gave us a publishing deal a, a, a music publishing deal the stat, what the statistician, statistician will do is sit there and calculate if you have some songs that will be published on a major record label, they will, they will sit there and calculate how much money they think, statistically speaking, your songs are going to make over the next, or the, over the life of the songs actually. They'll say, okay, this song is going to make 500000 this particular song may make 200000 or what have you. So what publishing companies, what we had, uh, publish, we had a publishing deal with EMI, what they would do is they would come to you, they'll say, Chris and Jay at the time, hey listen, we're going to give you $200,000 based on the amount of money we think your songs are going to make. And we took the deal, you know, was, was it a good or bad deal? We have, I don't have any idea. I don't, because at the time I was broke. So I was just happy to have some money coming in. That's why I admire Master P because from what I'm hearing his story, he turned down a million dollars. So I don't know how many people could do that. I don't even know if I'd want to do that. But with publishing, you surrender your rights to your music in exchange for money today. So the music publisher will say, listen, I will write you a check today for 200,000, but I want half of your publishing for the lifetime and throughout the universe of this music, throughout the universe. The music business is so gangster that the contracts have literally, they have throughout the universe, just in case man decides to play music off of planet Earth. I mean, it is so deep. The music business is cutthroat. And things are changing every day. So they'll give you a big check today in exchange for half of your publishing forever. So the reason people take it is, is because you get money now. And the music publisher, they can collect your publishing throughout the world, which you probably couldn't do that anyway. So that's one of the, and it's designed, and if you're a recording artist, I was a producer. If you're an artist, they will advance you. Another thing, they'll advance you money based on the future sales or the profit of your songs. And if your songs don't make money, guess what? You're in debt. You have to pay for the video. You have to pay for all the travel expenses out of your pocket. That's the money they advance you. So, you know, it might look good on TV and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, it's all smoke and mirrors. Okay, so I'm gonna get right to my items that I wanted to discuss with you. I remember coaching another Antonio Edwards uh, 
back in the day and he was another music producer and I told him, if you're in the studio making tracks, it means you're not outside looking for houses. So that really stuck and he's gone to do a lot of big and better things. So it's, it's kind of hard to do both businesses if you, if you want to make music because you're stuck in the studio all day. So I'm going to tell you, if you want to do both of these businesses, it's challenging. Okay. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk to you, number one, every studio needs a location. Every studio needs a location. When I was recording, I used to travel around the country going into these different studios. Windmark was my, my most frequent one. That's where I, was, I had an opportunity to work with Pharrell Williams. I get to that Hit Factory, Daddy's House, I went there, worked there. DARP, that was Dallas Austin down in Atlanta. My, my favorite and most memorable experience was working at Electric Lady. That, that is a Jimi Hendrix studio. It was about six levels below ground and when you're walking down to the studio that's got these little artwork and eclectic little chiclet tiles on the walls is just really it's really electrifying as you're walking to the studio that was great master sound with Rob Oles. every one of these studios something ticked with me as I'm working in the business over the years I'm like you know every one of these studios has to have a location so I'm wondering, are these people paying rent to somebody? Maybe the landowner is getting rent, or do they own the, the real estate where these studios are? But as I moved around, I'm like, I always had to be somewhere recording. So I'm thinking, mm, maybe I want to think about this real estate thing. That was the first spark that got in my mind about real estate. Another reason why I left the real estate, the, the real estate, uh, the, left the music business for real estate, uh, the the, um, right around 2000, I'd say one or two, the entire music business switched from analog to digital. The analog where you have little knobs you can turn, you can actually manipulate sound, where in digital all we are manipulating are ones and zeros. So there's literally no sound. Uh, analog, if you think about it, you've got a piece of tape, you've got a head, and that tape slides over the head, and the head plays or it recognizes the audio. Just like when you have a record, you drop the needle, it's actually picking up the audio from that record. But nowadays, everything's ones and zeros. So all of my equipment, um, I'm gonna say 90% of it, and I'm gonna show you a picture of my studio, went from being like the slamming stuff to have to being completely obsolete. So you'll see all that equipment there literally kind of is, has no value. It all got shrunk down into computers and computer programs. So now you've got all digital boards, You've got digital audio stuff, converters, and everything literally is almost digital now. So I can see things moving from in that direction. And what does the goal of digital is to make it more affordable, more, make it more transportable and smaller. If you remember those big back in the day, 24 tracks was a machine that looked like a washing machine. Now you can have unlimited tracks in a computer, literally, and just layering vocals on top of kicks and snares, bass, hi-hats, layering everything. You've got unlimited tracks right there in the box. We call it in the box. So that kind of, kind of, what, kind of gave me a symbol. Everything went from analog to digital and, and all the major studios were shutting down. The big one that I remember shutting down in New York City was the Hit Factory. I think around 2003 or four, I, was, I can't quite remember. Maybe it's three. This studio had been in business for 30 years. The biggest studio in New York City. Everybody wanted to record there. They had several floors in the building, different studios. And when they shut down, it was almost like a domino effect. That's when I noticed, um, what was it? I think Rob Osh sold his studio out there in Norfolk with Master Sound, so he wasn't, he sold his stuff. Cause he, actually he told me, he was like, Chris, this stuff's getting real smaller, so you don't really need the equipment. He saw the writing on the walls too. So everything went from analog to digital, and that's when making music and creating songs, recording, got real simpler and easier. People were just banging out songs in their bedrooms. All right, number three. After I got my publishing deal with EMI, about a year later, I found out, I did not know at the time, that Jay-Z, Beyonce, and Pharrell Williams were actually published through EMI at that time. This has been, wow. I'm scared to say it. This has been like 15 years ago when I got out of this stuff. I, I learned this. They were also on EMI too. And when you're hot, you're hot, right? Everybody wants to use you. So I'm submitting songs to all of these different artists. Little did I, did I know that Pharrell is also submitting songs to these artists too. Jay-Z is writing songs. You know, you don't see this in the, in the general public. 
But Jay-Z is a songwriter and he's writing songs stuff and he has a team of writers that are going to be writing songs for him and so does Pharrell and they're going to submit them under their name. So I'm going up against these heavy hitters and they're hot. So I'm like, why on earth is somebody going to pick little old me or when they can just use big names on their songs? True, I'm going to be cheaper, but there's, I'm, I'm saying these names because these are the biggest names. You've got all different notches and the hierarchy of sound songwriters, which I'm, I was one of the ones at the bottom. I'm a small guy, right? So <clears throat> I'm submitting songs and I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm not getting any more music published because so many other people are in front of me that have bigger names that are getting their stuff published. So you got to be aware. I, I was aware, like, look, there's just too much competition for me to get songs published when I'm going up with big names like this. And the reason I like real estate is because it doesn't matter how famous you are or how, how big your name is, you can still go and meet Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner, Mr. or Mrs. Seller and buy their house. It's very simple. Or if you're a wholesaler, just get their house in the contract and make 10, 20 grand, right? You don't have to have a big name to do that. You, you can just be an ordinary Joe Schmo. So that's another reason I got out of the music business. Too much competition. True, I was making a little bit of money, but I don't want to go up against Jay-Z. I mean, it's impossible for me to do that. And that's going to segue to me to my next one. It wasn't a good, how will you say, return on my investment. Wasn't a good return on my investment. Well, time that is. It wasn't a good return on my investment for my time, right? So when I would be in the studio for days in and days out, maybe 10, 11 o'clock in the morning to 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, 12 hour days. I did this probably for six years, 12 hour days in the studio. It wasn't fun. I might work on six, seven, eight songs, one, two, three albums for different people, right? And none of these songs or albums see the light of day. And these songs take time. It might take three, four months for me to do 10, 10 or 11, 12, 13 songs for somebody. You know, I might've made a few dollars, but I'm like, you know, these songs, they're done. And once the song is done, you can't shop it to another person because that's for that artist there, right? You can't make any more with the song. They've already bought it from you. So it's kind of like it wasn't a good return on my time. I might have four, five, six, seven songs done with a lady. Took me three, four weeks, right? And then they might say, the, the artist might say, well, you know what? We don't really want to go in that direction. So we got to scrap that material. I mean, just such wasting time in the business. So. That's another reason why I get out of the music business because in real estate, if I save my money or if I look at enough houses, it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed that I'm going to find a house that's going to work for me. It's power in numbers. Now, yes, you could possibly get a hit record after you're doing, I, can, I don't remember how many songs I wrote or produced before I had one published, but it was in the hundreds. Real estate isn't going to be like that. You're not going to look at over a hundred houses before you get one. So the more houses you look at, yes, you're going to get better deals, but it's, it's easier to get a house than it is to get a number one billboard song, right? A lot easier. So if I put that same amount of time into real estate, I can look at more houses. I can buy more houses. I can get in touch with more lenders, networking with more people that possibly do joint ventures with me. But in the music business, it's kind of like you, if you record more and more songs, they may or may not get published. You just never know. It's all a gamble. And that could be a complete waste of your life. Number five. Okay, number five. Constantly, I, always, I was always having to constantly create new music and a lot of it. Always making new music, more music. Everybody know, what else you got? What else you got? Good Lord. I'm getting chills as I'm remembering all those meetings I went to. Uh, I remember one time I was sitting outside of an A&R's office waiting to take, get my turn to go into this particular A&R. I believe it was Mark Prasad at uh, RCA Records. I think that was the meeting. Or it might have been with Rob, Rob Walker at Quest. One of these meetings. I'm sitting outside of the door, right? And I'm hearing all the, I'm hearing somebody go through. You can tell they're playing songs, listen to a, listening to about a minute. They listen to the first verse and the first chorus. That's kind of the, they want to see if they're going to get a feel or, or for the song or not. And I'm hearing these songs go by and they're slamming, man. I mean, bass is hitting, drums coming in, right, chorus, or orchestra, strings. And matter of fact, I thought I heard Jay-Z's voice on a few of them, right? So I'm like, this stuff's really hitting. 
Come to find out, the song's background vocals layering in there nicely. I mean, the, the lead vocals, the melodies slamming. What the ad labels are going on? Come, when the guy walked out, it was I did not know at the time, but he was representing Beyonce, right? This is where what led me to this realization of not wanting to compete with them. So I'm hearing song after song. I probably heard about 50 songs, and these were all sang by Beyonce Knowles. And I'm like, oh my god! I'm coming in a room after the A and R is listening to songs that were sang. I don't know if they were written or produced by her too. But I'm, I can't, I just can't compete with Beyonce, the biggest artist in the world now. So I'm walking in, I'm like, you know, I'm paying my little tracks. They have the same quality, but I just don't have that stamp, that air of legitimacy when I'm taking my meetings against, you know, a multi-platinum selling artist like her. So it's like when I went, I went inside that meeting, I didn't get any, they didn't, they call it track placements. I was looking for a placement when you're in the business. Somebody's working on an album and you submit songs to get a song placed on their album if they like you. But it's, it's, it's common sense. If they get a, a CD of songs from Chris Haskins or if the artist gets a CD of songs from Beyonce Knowles, I mean, it's, just, it's no comparison. I can't compete. Why well, I got out of the music business, right? So let's compare that to real estate. You only need a few houses to make $100,000 a year. Just a few. And publishing, literally, if you don't know, goes down over time. So when you get a music, when a song comes out, the most money you make is in the first few months. And after that, it goes downhill. So people think you make money for the rest of your life with music publishing. It doesn't work like that. People don't buy songs every day from the 90s or the early 2000s or what have you that aren't super popular. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions to the rules, but I'm talking about this ordinary average, we call them album songs that were never really released on a released as a single so too much competition i'm always having to make new music because i'm going up against heavy hitters i couldn't compete number six too many variables too many variables and filters standing in the way of my success so many and i'm i'm doing this video guys not based on a subjective or the way i feel about the music business this is these are facts because i wasn't even in the music business for money i was just in it because i enjoyed making music since i was in Ninth grade. Chris Henderson, I went to college, told me as he was working on it was uh, the case song, the Happily Ever After song. He said, Chris, you can write, record, produce, and, and uh, re produce a hit song, but they are, and even sing it, you can have the artist sing a hit song, but there's so many variables that take place after you leave the studio, right? After you leave the studio, there's so much that could happen. I mean, somebody could, when the song gets it to the, makes it to the record label, somebody could have a falling out with a coworker where that coworker had your project and they're, they're like, you know what? I don't want to deal with this project anymore. Your whole thing is done. I mean, you're not getting any more airplay at that record label if the, rep, if the person representing you moves companies or they have a falling out with a cousin that worked there or they had a relationship with somebody that doesn't like them anymore. A personal or, or intimate relationship it's so many variables that, you know at the record label that could happen they could get rid of that a that the department the r&b department or the rock department or the bluegrass department at that time and your stuff is just all you are is a file sitting on somebody's desk he said chris there's too many variables you can record a hit song but there's so much stuff that happens after you leave the studio you got to have a nice video it's got to be done top notch You've got to have the right marketing behind it, the right advertising, the right promotion. You got to have the right people's face in front of it so it can be cool when someone sees the commercial. You need to have the right people in the video, right? And nowadays you got the internet, so I don't even know how that's going to work. The internet is another dynamic to making the music business work. But it's, you know, and it's so many variables and the people at the top they don't have time to listen to a million demos, so they simply don't even want to hear the music because they have to work on the stuff that they're working on. Now, let's think about real estate. How many variables are there? The biggest variable is you. How much time and effort and work are you going to put into making your real estate business a success? You've only got a few variables. Your lender, who's going to lend you the money? The seller, you look at them, you talk to enough sellers or learn how to talk to sellers you can download my book, The Real Estate Negotiating Bible. I'll show you exactly how to talk to sellers. Real simple. 
You got a realtor, you need to meet a realtor somewhere at three. And a contractor, you need a good contractor. That's if you're gonna buy something. If you're wholesaling, all you need to do is a, a good title company and be able to talk to a seller, that's it. And I mean, buyers are gonna come, they don't even care if you can talk to them or not, they just want the deal if you're wholesaling. So there are very few variables in real estate. Okay, so I got music business, a lot of variables. Real estate business, four or five variables. I think I hate that better. I'm done. And if you hold real estate, then another, vari another variable is your tenant. But through time, we can kind of coach you how to do that, or you can learn how to do tenant screening. Number seven, I always had to...